Hi everyone, my name is Miranda and I'm the Senior Foundation Administrator at the Church Foundation. Um, I'm here today with Professor John Woff, who is a Professor of Endocrinology at the University of Oxford and he is also one of the founders of the Church Foundation. Today's video is a quick virtual Q&A with Professor Woff and I'll be asking him questions that have been sent in to us by our members. Hi John, thanks ever so much for joining us today, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, let's get started with the first question. In the past 18 months, I've had several stress fractures in my left foot and a broken left ankle. Is hydrocortisone thinning my bones? It can if you take too much hydrocortisone. Um, and uh, what you should always do if you're on hydrocortisone around the age of 55 or 60, have a bone mineral density measured to see where you are on the spectrum because if you've got thin bones, then you can have treatment. So too much steroids thin your bones. Uh, ordinary doses of steroids don't thin your bones, but you should have a bone mineral density done. What are the long-term risks of radiation therapy? Radiation therapy to the pituitary gland can cause some things. The most common thing it causes is an underactivity of the pituitary gland because it damages the pituitary and the normal functioning pituitary. So when you've had pituitary radiotherapy, you need to have regular assessments, usually every year of your pituitary function to make sure it hasn't become underactive because if it has, you'll get symptoms of such things as tiredness and things and replacement therapy can be given. So it's important to measure your pituitary function every year. There are, those are the only really serious side effects which can be mitigated against by regular checking. Can the dexamethasone suppression test definitively rule out Cushing's if someone suppresses? In the vast majority of cases dexamethasone suppression tests are very reliable. So if you suppress normally on dexamethasone you have only a very small chance of having Cushing's. So it's 98% reliable. Um, so if you don't suppress on, on dexamethasone, there are other causes besides Cushing's, but uh, to exclude Cushing's, if you do suppress on dexamethasone, you only have a very small chance of having Cushing's and 98% of patients who are normal do suppress on dexamethasone. So it's a very reliable test. It's the best there is. Better than 24-hour urinary cortisol and midnight cortisols. What is the best way to test for cyclical Cushing's? Well, we don't really know how often cyclical Cushing's happens. And so there's no best way. Usually you need to measure urinary 24 hour cortisol or midnight cortisols using saliva on a weekly or monthly basis. But there's no accepted way. You just need to do it regularly uh, every week or every month, depending on how frequent the the patient thinks the cycles are. What can I do if my endocrinologist won't listen to me and discharges me? Well you're entitled to get a second opinion and uh, people will usually know it slightly depends where you are uh, but you can always get a second opinion if you've been discharged from the clinic. Um, I think it's really important that uh, there are people who know about these things at the Pituitary Foundation and they can usually give advice in these circumstances. There's some very helpful uh, telephone line nurses who are absolutely amazingly wonderful and helpful. So I think in those circumstances that will, that's how I would approach that particular, particular difficulty. Can you get regular low but in range morning cortisol blood tests if you have cyclical Cushing's? Yes, you can, but it's uncommon. We don't really know enough. We're just about to embark on a study on cyclical Cushing's because it's something which is not completely clearly understood. But yes, you can, but it's uncommon to get low normal cortisols in cyclical Cushing's. Can a pituitary tumour change type or start secreting additional hormones? For example, could a prolactinoma start to produce ACTH as well? That's not been described as far as I know, but there are some patients that are also very rare who have more than one pituitary tumour. And so uh, that's, that's been described, but to change from one to another, I've not heard of. And as far as I know, it hasn't been described. 
Um, do you have a preferred point in the IGF-1 range you like to achieve with your acromegalization? Some people say their endos like them to be in the lower third of the range or in the middle of the range. If that's the case, how much of a difference does that make compared to just scraping into the range? We, the answer to that is that you want the IGF-1 in the local normal range and it doesn't really matter where it is. Nobody's done any decent work to show exactly where in the normal range it should be, but we know that if you have a normal IGF-1, your mortality is normal as, as, as the population. So you don't have a raised mortality if you have an IGF-1 in the normal range. So there's no particular part of the normal range that's desirable because the data simply aren't there. But for the most part, patients who have a normal IGF-1 after treatment of acromegaly have a normal mortality. Acromegaly patients often seem to report ongoing symptoms like headaches and fatigue, even when IGF-1 and growth hormone are controlled. Is this something you acknowledge? And if so, do you know why this might be? Yes, I think if you do have uh, uh, ongoing fatigue, it's really important to look at a number of different things. So is your thyroid hormone replacement therapy, that needs to be in the upper part of the normal range, the value for thyroxine. Um, you need to make sure there are not other causes of fatigue like vitamin D deficiency uh, and B12 deficiency. So if you have got fatigue and your hormones are correctly monitored, then you should have a normal life expectancy. And in fact, we've written a paper on this showing that if you have uh, hormone levels which are, are normal, then your quality of life should be normal. So if you have ongoing fatigue, which is significantly adversely affecting your life, then your, 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 your endocrinologist should look for other causes, as I say, like vitamin D deficiency and other things which could be causing fatigue, which are reversible. Should patients on sandostatin be shielding? Some have told they should be because it's an immunosuppressant, but others haven't. No, I, there's no evidence that you get uh, sh you need to be shielded on sandostatin. It's not it's not a significant immunosuppressant, and patients with acromegaly on sandostatin don't have an increased risk. So I'm okay. happy about that. If pituitary patients on steroids have been shielding and not had COVID-19, would you recommend extra precautions for further months to reduce risk? I think, I think actually, um, I think people should be careful not to get it. People on steroids are not at increased risk of getting COVID-19, uh, but I think that uh, it's something to avoid having. In fact, I've just come off a telephone call with the Addison's Disease Self-Help Group and there was only, we only know, and there was Brazilians, Americans, Canadians, Europeans, and English, all there. And there's only one person that they know of who's had a fatality with Addison's or adrenal insufficiency. So basically, uh, there's no increased risk. But I think that um, you should avoid getting it if you possibly can. Should you continue being shielded? I think probably I would be very careful. Uh, I don't think necessarily you need to be shielded, but you should be very careful going out and maintaining your distance and all the things about washing hands and washing things when they come into the house and all that sort of business. If a pituitary patient gets COVID-19, would you recommend tripling the hydrocortisone dose? The recommendation is to double the hydrocortisone dose. And I think that's clearly out there. The Society for Endocrinology have given some really clear guidelines for this. And so doubling the dose is the important thing. So the important things are, number one, to have a spare two or three weeks supply of your hydrocortisone. And number two, to have a, a, an injection kit. So that's an ample a needle and a syringe so that if you need to, you can give it in an emergency or it can be given by somebody in your family or one of the paramedics. How do we change perceptions of the importance and seriousness of endocrinology within the general medical profession? Shouldn't there be a set protocol which should be followed in endocrinology departments? So this is something which is very interesting. So we're doing a whole load of work in the Society for Endocrinology, rethinking exactly how we manage patients. I think it's possible to do that much more commonly over the telephone. Um, and I think that uh, you need to see new patients with thyroid disease and acromegaly as well. Uh, but I think after that, you can usually see patients on the uh, on the telephone. I've just f finished going around all the hospitals in England, looking at their 
their service, their quality of work. It's interesting that endocrinology referrals have gone up by 30% in the last five years over and above other medical conditions. And so endocrinology is not dying away. It's still a common problem which is being seen more frequently. Should we have common protocols? Well, I think that that's the right, that's the right direction of travel. And so one of the things that we're doing in the Society for Endocrinology is to work out what are the tests that need to be done before a patient comes to the clinic, what tests should be done during his or her uh, appointments, and uh, what tests should be done before they go to the specialist. So I think we're trying to make it much more rigorous in terms of what tests need to be done and when. And uh, there's a group of people just being set up by the society to do just that. And we've done quite a lot of thinking about it already. Very good point. Okay, that's all our questions for today. So, um, so can I talk about the 500 Faces campaign of the Pituitary Foundation? When I was a little a boy, I helped to found the Pituitary Foundation. And I think over the last 25 years, and that's how long it's been in existence, it's done fantastic work supporting patients with pituitary disease. Uh, these diseases are uncommon and often people don't necessarily know other people with similar diseases and so the networking is important. The information provided to patients is important and a lot of pamphlets are there in the departments up and down in the country. But with this COVID crisis, the income from, the, from uh, events has gone down drastically and the Pituitary Foundation is in a little bit of danger in terms of finances. And so I would like to urge you, if you possibly can, afford, which is not a huge sum, I don't think, £100 to become one of the 500 faces in the Pituitary Foundation. This will ensure its continuity. It's a charity which is hugely beneficial to a large number of people with rare diseases, and they find the information that's given, the support they have given, and those sort of pieces of information absolutely invaluable in improving their quality of life. And I hope you can give generously as per the requests of the Pituitary Foundation, which is my favorite charity. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you found this video useful um, and a huge thank you to Professor Walsh from all of us at the Pituitary Foundation uh, for giving up his time to answer your questions and also for supporting our 500 Faces campaign. Um, the link will appear in a minute if you want to find out more or join the campaign.